Um, hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Greta Michael. I'm a grad student here at Florida State University. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't get my webcam to work. I, I'm having some maybe Mac issues, but um, thank you all for coming. So today I'm going to talk about part of my master's thesis work, um, which includes two numerical models and a field investigation of a small watershed in Pensacola. But this presentation is just going to focus on ArcLet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my research. And then I'm going to talk about what ArcLet is, uh, why people use it. I'll talk a little bit about septic systems and nitrogen. And then I'll talk a little bit about my study area and some modeling results that I have. So um, ArcLet is the ARC Nitrate Load Estimation Toolkit. Um, my thesis work is titled Numerical Modeling and Field Investigation of Nitrate Loading from Septic Systems to Surface Water Bodies in the Bayo Chico Watershed of Pensacola, Florida. So first, I'm just going to talk about overall research goals. So the purpose of my research broadly is to determine the impacts of stay at home orders on the amount of septic system source nitrogen loading. I'm not really going to talk that much about that and the data I have behind that. I'm just really going to talk about what is ArcLit and how I've used it and applied it. Um, this presentation will just provide a brief overview of ArcLit. Again, that stands for Nitrate Load Estimation Toolkit and its application to a small watershed with distinctive land use characteristics. Um, so a lot of this research is in collaboration with the Gulf Breeze EPA office and I'll get into that a little bit later when I talk about some previous studies. Um, so since ArcLet is used um, to determine nitrogen loading or nitrate loading, I'm going to talk a little bit about nitrogen pollution and then I'm going to talk a little bit about septic systems and the nitrogen cycle. So as I'm sure most of you know, nitrogen is a necessary nutrient for life, but in excess it is harmful to human health and local ecology and um, the tourism industry. So nitrogen in excess can lead to eutrophication and algal blooms. So this then leads to dead zones where free oxygen is depleted. And then eventually you have hypoxia, which is a complete lack of free oxygen. So that just occurs by, by you have really dense algae, they die and they use up that free oxygen and then they block it all and it's just a dead zone. Um, currently the Gulf of Mexico is the largest dead zone in the US due to nutrient pollution. And that's mainly just because so many rivers ultimately drain to the Gulf of Mexico. So I'm sure a lot of people probably know the basic of septic systems, but uh, it's pretty important to study them in Florida. So 30% of Florida residents use septic systems. They're also called on-site sewage treatment and Disposal systems, they're interchangeable terms. Um, and Florida is home to 12% of the nation's septic systems, just because in so many parts of Florida, it's not really cost effective to have rural homes on central sewer, or it's just not feasible at all. Um, so basically over here, we just have your typical septic system on the left. And these work by raw sewage is just collected in this septic tank. So it comes in from these pipes. It then separates into the effluent and the sludge. So the effluent is the liquid, the sludge is the solid, it goes to the bottom. That's what people need to get cleaned out every so often. But the effluent is eventually, um, or it was released into the drain field, which is in the soil, it's all above the water table. And then it will eventually enter groundwater which then leads to surface water bodies. Um, so the efficacy of a septic system really mainly depends on owner maintenance, but also whatever soil types and hydraulic properties you have in that soil under the drain field. Um, septic systems, no surprise, are consistently the most reported groundwater contamination source in the US. So now I'm going to talk a little bit, a small part of the nitrogen cycle. I'm not really going to get too deep into the nitrogen cycle just because it gets so complex and so dense really quickly. So we study nitrogen because it's highly reactive and it's very mobile in soil. So on the left here, sorry, I need to move the panel so I can see. 
Um, we have our basic schematic of the nitrogen cycle. This is kind of like an idealized flow. Uh, it's real world, so it's not always in the same flow. But basically, there are two forms of, or two nitrogen compounds that we get from septic systems. So ammonium, which is 75% of the total nitrogen in effluent, and organic nitrogen, which is around 25% of total nitrogen in effluent. So we have ammonium enter the Vedo zone and undergo nitrification. And then we have the organic nitrogen in the enters the Vedo zone and the Vedo zone being the soil it's not saturated it's above the water table and organic nitrogen will enter the Vedo zone and it'll quickly undergo a monification a monification is a um, highly favorable form of respiration it can occur with oxygen without oxygen so it will quickly undergo ammonification. And then that ammonium that was sourced from the organic nitrogen then undergoes nitrification. So you have basically all nitrate from those two sources of septic system nitrogen compounds. And nitrate has two fates. It can either undergo denitrification in low oxygen conditions, or it can move down the soil and enter groundwater. So ideally we want full denitrification um, because we don't want all this nitrate in our water. But denitrification um, depends on what conditions you have. So it's an anaerobic respiration. So it needs to be in low oxygen conditions. And it's also really dependent on like what soil type you have. If you have really steep slopes and really sandy soils, it's not really conducive. It's not really favorable to denitrification. So in those types of areas, you would tend to have a lot of nitrate in the groundwater. So back to Arclet. Um, I just feel that it's kind of important to go over septic systems and nitrogen before getting back into Arclet. So Arclet, again, nitrate load estimation toolkit is an ArcGIS based model used to simulate groundwater nitrate bait and transport. This model has three modules, groundwater flow, nitrate transport, and nitrate load estimation. So the groundwater flow module uses DEM data to reproduce the water table shape. It just really needs that hydraulic gradient for you to have a reasonable model. So Arclet assumes that the hydraulic gradient can be approximated by smooth DEM. The nitrate transport module uses a 2D steady state equation to describe reactive transport, and it does account for the biogeochemical processes that I discussed earlier, mainly being denitrification. And the nitrate load estimation module uses a really simple mass balance approach to estimate the difference between the mass of nitrate entering the groundwater and the mass of nitrate removed via biogeochemical processes, uh, being denitrification. So, I'm not really going to get too much into the numerical model of this aspect. I'm really just going to talk about the conceptual model. So this is really math heavy if you get into the numerical modeling. And it uses a lot of equations that are mainly just used in hydrology and hydrogeology. So it's really niche and it's really not important to understand the model. Um, Arclet is most commonly used for um, septic to sewer conversion projects. So a lot of consulting firms, I say a lot of, it's not that commonly used, but mainly it's used by consulting firms for smaller government agencies to use that to determine um, our septic system a big source of pollution for that area. Would it be cost effective for all of these septic systems to be converted to sewer? So that's usually the main use of Arclet. I'm gonna talk about the inputs and outputs before I get back into the specific um, info on each module, because I'm going to talk about the inputs as I talk about the modules. So Arclet inputs are, for the most part, pretty readily available, pretty easy to process. So inputs include DEM data, which you can easily get from USGS or many other sites. Um, septic system data, so you would just need a shape file with um, points for each septic system at their location, um, and soil hydraulic properties, which you can easily get this data from Sergo and the Arclet application manual 
tells you how to really easily convert that into the rasters that you need for input. Um, and you also need edited NHD water body data. And I say edited NHD data, um, NHD being National Hydrography Data Set, because the NHD uh, water body data is known to be wildly inaccurate. Um, the NHD is by USGS, and it's such a large scale operation that many small water bodies will not be included. So it's pretty inaccurate, but you can just use DEM and Google Earth to figure out where you have missing water bodies and add those back in. Um, but you really have to edit it because if you just use the original NHD water body data, you're going to have really unreliable, unreasonable model results. And you also need some nitrogen transport parameters um, and parameters of biogeochemical processes, which you can mainly determine probably using literature reviews and tweaking inputs to match your water quality data. So outputs include water table shape, particle flow paths, uh, flow paths being the nitrogen, flowing from septic systems to surface water bodies, nitrate load estimations, nitrate concentrations at the water table and groundwater, and ArcLet can be calibrated using nitrate concentrations at the water table and of groundwater and water table elevations. So I will say the uh, most time consuming and hardest part of the calibration will be uh, your smoothing process and calibrating that water table shape. So now I'm going to get into a little bit more detail of the modules within ArcLet. So again, I'm not going to talk about the numerical models behind it. I'm only going to really go over the conceptual models. So the groundwater flow module is the module where you recreate the hydraulic gradient. So the groundwater flow module is simplified by assuming that the water table is a subdued replica of the topography of the surficial aquifer. This assumption is generally valid for shallow aquifers in flat or gently rolling terrain. So um, you can't really apply this into any type of mountainous region. Um, I do know that this model has been applied to all parts of Florida and there haven't been issues with that, but I just know mountainous areas are definitely a no-go and it won't be reliable. Um, so, but based on that assumption, the shape of the water table can be generated by smoothing the DEM within ArcLit. So the smoothing process is done within the model itself. Uh, the smoothing process is specified by the user and is somewhat trial and error. And this parameter must be calibrated against field measurements of hydraulic heads. So this is the most time consuming, most difficult part of the model. It's really, uh, you really have to know your study area and it really takes a lot of work to get this part reasonable. Um, so from the simulated hydraulic gradient and inputs of the heterogeneous soil hydraulic properties, ArcLet then calculates the direction and the magnitude of flow, which is necessary for the flow path simulation. You need to have the correct direction and magnitude to get those particle paths for them to be reasonable. So the transport and fate module is definitely uh, really dense the mathematicals are mathematical models behind it are dense so I'm really only going to talk about these conceptual models so over here on the left is the nitrate transport model and over here on the right is the conceptual model of nitrate fate so I'm going to break this figure down here on the left this top rectangle uh, you can't really tell but it is bound by dotted lines the top rectangle is the Vado zone so it's the unsaturated zone above the water table. The bottom rectangle that's filled in with that light gray is the saturated zone, it's the groundwater. And the YZ plane is a source plane with a constant con concentration. So meaning that the concentration doesn't change every day. So Y is the width of the drain field, Z being the depth of which the nitrate plume goes to, and the concentration being the uh, input from septic systems being constant, meaning it doesn't change every day. Um, and that's just for modeling simplification purposes. Um, so over here is the, on the right is then 
conceptual model for nitrate fate. So the red box indicates the groundwater system. So from your septic system, you have nitrate. And that nitrate, again, has two fates. It can undergo denitrification or it can end up in water bodies. And same for ammonium. So ammonium can undergo nitrification to nitrate. Um, also, a small amount can go to water bodies. The load estimation portion is very simple. Uh, it's just estimated using a really simple mass balance approach for the rasterized concentration field, which I'll show you guys towards the end, um, and where the nitrogen mass entering the water bodies equals the difference between nitrogen entering groundwater and nitrogen removed during groundwater transport. So removal being denitrification. So, sorry guys, I don't know what happened with this text box. Um, I think something happened when I converted this to a PDF, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, this is the Arclet GUI. So, it's made pretty user-friendly with this GUI. Uh, it's The code project is structured in a modular fashion, and further modularization is kept within the development of the GUI and the submodules. So, all input files have to be prepared outside of Arclet, but all output files are just ArcGIS layers that can be readily post-processed and visualized within ArcGIS, with the exception of the load estimation output file, it's a CSV file. So over here is your ArcLet GUI. This is for the groundwater flow module, where your inputs are the DEM, um, you have hydraulic conductivity and soil porosity, and the water water bodies. So this options and parameters, this is the smoothing um, factor, the smoothing process. So you have the option to fill sinks, um, it gives you, you can input whatever number you want for the smoothing factor. It varies for every region, every study area. And again, it's really kind of trial and error. So your outputs here would be the magnitude and the direction, and then also that hydraulic gradient. So this, that would be the subdued DEM, the smooth DEM. So now that I've explained Arclet, I'm going to talk about my study area and then I'll show some work from Arclet in my study area. So my study area is in Pensacola, Florida, which is in Escambia County. It's the westernmost county in the Florida Panhandle. And I do want to point out that um, Escambia County and this study area is not served by the Floridian Aquifer. It's not a karst system. So the Floridian Aquifer is, I think, basically here to the rest of Florida. But over here, this most western region of the Panhandle is served by the surficial aquifer system, specifically the sand and gravel aquifer. So not that you can't use Arclay within karst systems. I just want to point out this is not part of the Floridian Aquifer. So the Bayo Chico watershed is in Pensacola, Florida, and it's part of the Pensacola Bay System. So over here in the center is showing um, the whole region is the Bayo Chico watershed, and there are three sub-basins within it. There's Jackson Creek, Jones Creek, and the Bayo Chico drain sub-basin, which will be referred to as the Bayo outflow sub-basin. Um, there are two other bios in the Pensacola Bay system. So there's the Bio Grande and I believe Bio Texar is to the north. So each sub basin has a main, I guess, water body in it. So we have Bayo Chico um, and there's two tributaries. There's one to the north and one to the south. So the northern tributary is Jackson Creek. Um, and there also are the three Jackson Lakes within that sub basin. And on the southern part of Bayo Chico, there is Jones Creek, which leads into Jones Swamp, which is preserved land. Um, Bayo Chico is a historically degraded water body. It's impaired by nutrients, bacteria, specifically fecal coliform and mercury. Anthropogenic pollution has been reported as early as 1955. So it's had a lot of major fish kills in the past. Uh, it's had a lot of issues with water quality, it's just all, all of the bayos in the Pensacola Bay system are pretty degraded. 
Okay, I don't know what happened when I saved this as a PDF. Sorry, guys. Um, things got a little moved around. But this study area was chosen due to its really distinctive land use. So if you see over here on the right, the base layer is just the base map. The red uh, polygraph, the red polyline is the outline of the whole watershed with the three sub-basins. So Jackson Creek, Subbasin, Jones Creek, Subbasin, and Bayo outflow. And the orange dots represent septic systems. So the Jackson Creek and Bayo Chico outflow subbasins are mainly residential and have very high density of septic systems. And the Jones Creek subbasin is largely industrial and also the preserved um, swamp land. Um, so the table over here on the left is just showing you the number of septic systems per subbasin. So total. This research accounts for 1,576 septic systems. And uh, I do want to point out the watershed area, I believe, is just over 10 square miles. Um, again, sorry for the misplacement. Something happened when I exported it as a PDF. So a little more on previous studies. Uh, Bayo Chico has been noted as having the largest average concentrations of most contaminants compared to other bios in the Pensacola Bay system. It was first declared as impaired in 1971, and it still holds impaired status per EPA. A recent EPA nitrogen speciation study in the watershed, which this is what I was referring to earlier when I said that a lot of this research is in collaboration with the Gulf Breeze EPA. So this is their study. Um, their study indicated that Jackson Creek watershed, um, the northern one, the mainly residential area, Jackson Creek, um, that Creek had nitrite, nitrate, and total dissolved nit nitrogen concentrations five times those in the other subbasins, and that greater than 50% of the total dissolved nitrogen in Jackson Creek is inorganic nitrogen compared to a range of 2 to 20% in the other subbasins. So high inorganic nitrogen is indicative of septic systems, because like I said in the very beginning, effluent is um, largely 75% ammonium. Um, organic nitrogen is largely sourced from farmland, um, fertilizers, golf courses, things like that. And then also Jackson Creek throughout that watershed had five to six times the amount of sucralose and three to four times the amount of caffeine in their surface water samples. So it's pretty obvious that Jackson Creek is largely affected by septic systems compared to the other bios, or the other sub-basins, sorry. And that's kind of why we're doing this study, because we can tell that uh, there is some heavy septic system pollution going on. So now I'm going to go over some of the ARCLET modeling. So this is just showing the input data, and then next I'm going to go over some preliminary results. So. This is the input data I was talking about earlier, the DEM and the soil hydraulic properties. So if you'll notice in each of these images, it's that same red outline of the watershed and the subbasins, and the orange dots, again, represent septic systems, and the really light blue colored um, layer is the edited NHD water body data. So for this study area, the NHD data was really, really, really inaccurate. It was very off. So um, I spent a lot of time on Google Earth and using a really fine resolution of DEM to correct that. Uh, you really have to have correct water bodies if you want your model to be reasonable. So this large image over here on the left, the base layer is DEM. It was obtained from USGS. Um, it's The units are one third arc second, which is just under 10 meters, 10 meters by 10 meters per cell. Um, the warmer colors represent higher values of elevation and the cooler colors represent lower values, which you can tell the northern region is largely orange, has a much higher elevation compared to near the bay, which is really basically sea level. 
Um, over here, the top left image is soil porosity, which this data was obtained from Sergo, and um, the application manual tells you how to easily convert that into these rasters. Um, the bottom right image is the hydraulic conductivity. So as you can tell, the northern region, again, uh, warm colors represent higher values, cooler colors represent lower values. So over here, you have pretty low hydraulic conductivity in this northern region in the Jackson Creek subbasin. Okay, you guys. Um, I don't understand why everything got so jumbled up, but this is uh, the part that I was talking about where the smoothing process is the most time consuming and um, the hardest part, pretty much. So this figure is the DEM base layer. This is the final DEM that was used in um, simulation. So I'm going to compare it really quick. So this is the original DEM. You can tell um, it's much finer. And then this is very smooth. So my final smoothing factor ended up being 350, which is pretty large, but there is uh, a very big difference in the topography in the northern and southern region. So a large smoothing factor was necessary. So this black line in the center represents the line that all of these profile graphs were taken at. So the first profile graph A represents the profile using original DEM, so the DEM on the previous slide. And you can see it shows all of these minor changes in elevation, which uh, you don't really want because you know that the water table shape is not like that. So B represents a smoothing factor of 100 where water bodies were added back 10 times. So um, that's not always the case. You don't always have to add water bodies back like that. But basically what that means was I extracted by mask the original DEM values for the water bodies because I knew I needed a high smoothing factor for this area. But when I used a high smoothing factor, I found that a lot of these smaller water bodies were being smoothed out that they weren't represented in the DEM anymore. So not every um, smoothing process has to do this. It's pretty time consuming to do that. But basically, I would just smooth using a factor of 10. And then I would add back the original elevation of the water bodies. And I repeated that until I smoothed using a factor of 350 and adding back the water bodies 35 times. So as you can tell, it is pretty time consuming. And Obviously, just by looking at this at profile graph E, you can tell that's not what the water table sh shape would actually be, but again, it's a model. So as long as your um, water table is giving you reasonable results for the particle paths, then uh, you can just choose to accept that. So it's a model, it's obviously not just like the real world, but it leads to reasonable results. So this is just, the process of smoothing for me. So my final smoothing factor down here, uh, you can tell it's much more smooth than the original, but again, a water table wouldn't look exactly like that. So this is the um, transport module. So these are the simulated particle paths after completing the smoothing process. So if the paths are not reasonable, there is an issue with one of the following, the smoothing process, probably the smoothing process, lacking or inaccurate water body data or lacking or inaccurate data of soil hydraulic properties. So basically reasonable being all paths, all particle paths will start at a septic system and they must terminate at a water body, at a surface water body. So if you have paths, if you um, make errors in your smoothing process, you might have paths that just merge together um, or they just don't terminate at water bodies. So it's pretty important to spend a lot of time getting a good estimation of your water table. So these green lines are representing the flow paths beginning at the septic systems and they ultimately must end at 
surface water bodies. And I know just by knowing my study area that this is reasonable, that these flow paths match hydraulic head data, that this is reasonable. Okay, so on to the um, plumes. So this is again, part of the load estimation, part of the transport module. So the image on the left, is just showing the whole watershed and this actually is not the final denitrification rate I use. This is a much larger denitrification rate than I have determined is reasonable for my study area. So um, again, same as the other scales, warmer colors represent higher values, cooler colors represent lower values. So these plumes follow these particle paths um, this is showing you the concentration. So these large plumes right here, which is a close-up view of this um, easternmost end of Bayo Chico on Maggie's Ditch, it's indicating that there is large loading here. So if you'll see, there's a lot of plumes that uh, start out warm and they go to blue and they just terminate. They don't end up a water body. So that is indicating that that area, those specific plumes have undergone full denitrification, which is what you want really. Um, but again, also this, this is a larger denitrification rate than I'm actually using for my simulations in this research. So I would actually have larger plumes and more plumes terminate at water bodies. So less denitrification. And these are some preliminary results. These are load estimations for select water bodies in the study area. And again, I guess when I exported this, it jumbled some things up. But basically, this figure on the right is circling the water bodies that are represented in this graph that shows the nitrate load estimation in pounds per year for each of these water bodies IDs. And this figure on the left at the top is showing you that's water body 285, which is Bayo Chico. That figure is just to show you that it's a really large water body and that's why that value is so high. But you can see that for 53, which is circled over here on the left, it's part of Jackson Creek, um, just a small portion of Jackson Creek and it has pretty moderately high values. Um, and then 210 and 101, those are parts of the Jackson Lakes, they have much lower loading values. And this again is just estimated using um, mass in to groundwater minus the mass removed via denitrification equals the mass that will enter your water bodies. So this is what this graph over here on the left, this is what um, consulting companies want to give to these local government agencies to just show um, is nitrate loading significant? Is it something that's minor? Um, do you need to convert to septic? So that's kind of the end game. What you really want is this, to see these plumes and to get these load estimation values. And so these are some Arclet resources and that is the end of my presentation. So um, thank you guys for coming. I do apologize about the jumbling up of the slides. I guess something happened when I sent it from my desktop to my laptop and exported it. But if you guys have any questions, let me know. Well, Greta, that was terrific. There's a lot of great detail. And um, and I saw a lot of names in here that are attending, a lot of people that I know that are very familiar with this sort of business. So I'm glad to see them interested. Um, I encourage anyone to ask questions in the questions panel. Um, I don't see any in there at the moment. Um, if you would, Greta, if anybody had any follow-up questions for you, they get a hold of you th uh, through what email address? Um, yes, so I'll go back to my first slide. Okay. And by the way, I know the conversion issue that you talked about to, you know, from PowerPoint to PDF, familiar with that. And it really, I, I think it was fine. Don't you worry. I usually check that, but I actually just really quickly convert. Yeah. Right before this present. So that was on my end, but. No biggie. It was too 
Well, we got a, we got a question. Um, do you need to think about this kind of analysis in areas that do not dump into big water bodies? Um, I guess it would depend on the area. So if it's highly residential or if it's highly agriculture, um, well, if it's highly residential, you might want to check into that because um, even if it's not going to like a really large water body, it could be really heavy in the groundwater and going to like small creeks. Uh, that might be an issue. If it's largely like preserved land, probably not. Um, probably really just largely residential areas this applies to. Thank you. And another question is, uh, what are some of the problems you would encounter if someone said to do this for the whole country? <laughs> um, so again, I have only seen this on relatively large scale, and I know you couldn't apply it to the whole country just because of those assumptions you make. So it uses some assumptions. So it uses a common like dupuy forsheimer assumption, which is and hydrology, but you can't really apply this to mountainous regions just because of that groundwater flow module that I was talking about, where you're rep where you're replicating the hydraulic gradient using a subdued topography. That won't work for mountainous regions. It'll only work for. Well, Greta, I misspoke. It's county and not country. Oh, county. I'm sorry. County. So. Um, oh, county. Ambia or you know. Oh. Um, I yeah, you can apply this to the county. So um, I'm not. I'm just studying this one small area since it's master thesis work. But you could definitely apply this to a whole county. Okay. Or you can apply this to specific areas that are considering uh, septic to sewer conversion. So that's the most mm -hmm. common one. It's like if they're going to convert specific neighborhoods or just specifically near larger water bodies, it tends to be. But you could do this for a county. Okay. And um, another question is, uh, what do you think is the age range of the septic systems, I guess, in your particular um, research area? Um, so I'm actually modeling a few different scenarios. So I have a lot of septic system data on mine. So I'm going to be modeling a few uh, scenarios based on the amount of septic systems that are. So another portion of my numerical modeling is going to be accounting for failing septic systems, which um, this area is not too many old septic systems. So there's been a lot of replacements. I have a lot of data on this. So I don't know if it's easy to find this kind of data for other places, but if you have a lot of failing septic systems, you can use something like ArcSWAT, which is another numerical modeling model I'm using to account for failing septic systems. So ArcLet doesn't specifically account for failing septic systems if that's what you're concerned about as far as age goes. Um, this accounts for functioning septic systems only. But as long as it's functioning, it really doesn't matter the age for ArcLet. Okay. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? Okay. I don't see any. Um, well, I think you've done a wonderful job. This is an interesting topic. And I would encourage anybody, uh, if I missed your question or you have a follow up question, um, definitely get a hold of Greta. Her email address is here on this page. And um, I want to thank you, Greta, for presenting. I think you did a phenomenal job, and I think you've got a great career ahead of you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, if you want to email me. I will be in the field this weekend, but I'll get back soon. Okay. And I want to thank all of the attendees that are still hanging on. We've got 32 still listening. Um, on behalf of all of us at Trug, I want to thank you for attending these last couple of days. Uh, I know we've um, we've all really missed being together at the FSU Convention Center uh, for obvious reasons. We're doing it this way. Uh, I still think it was successful and very really glad uh, personally to make sure that the GIS community uh, is, is able to huddle together and, and share um, what they've been working on. And we'll look forward to um, doing some more things together in the near future. So thank you, everybody. 
and uh, have a good rest of the day. Take care. And thank you, Greta. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for attending.